We have special guests with us. Former Senator Mike Ravel is here. Mike, how are you? Not too bad, Jimmy. Thank you for having me on. So it's great to have you back on. They announced the first uh, debate. Is uh, The Democrats announced their first debate. And it's going to be the 26th and 27th of uh, June. Now, I know you're running for president. Did you make the debates? No, I didn't. Uh, I, and, uh, my, the kids who are running the campaign told me about a week ago that it didn't look like we were going to get sufficient numbers. I think we got about 45,000 uh, donors, uh, and uh, but that's obviously not enough to make the cut. We've been on several polls, uh, but... Are, those polls are not entirely being recognized by the Democratic Party. But I'm not upset about not being on board. We may pursue a streaming uh, process. Uh, we're investigating that. But uh, every hope is that we'll be on the debates in July. And if not July, we'll hang in there to August, September, whatever. Uh, and, and so the benefit to the issues that we're talking about is not so much in being on the debate. It's being discussed and and the people treating the issues uh, intelligently. So whether it's direct democracy with my legislature of the people, or it's a need to have a new uh, investigation into the 9-11 commission, uh, all of those things will come to the fore as we pursue our efforts. Um, so... Well, tell me why 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 are you running again, and what what are you trying to do? <clears throat> I'm running because I would. Well, first off, it wasn't my idea. It's these kids that talked me into <laughs> running. You know, when when they said that I should run for president, I said, "Do you have any idea how old I am?" You know, uh, if you can see the picture, I look like I'm 89 years old, and I'm 89 years old. Uh, and, but but what the reason for running is to be able to take the attention that showered on me as an individual by running and transfer that to knowledge of issues for the American people. Stand by. I'm sorry. No problem. This was, no problem. Okay, well, uh, that's it. That, okay, so uh, go. do you want to finish? Go ahead. Uh, who me or you? <laughs> <laughs> so what so, are you? So you want to take the uh, attention? You're, the, call. the attention. <laughs> did you take it? I, I took. I took care of that call. It's done. <laughs> it, it, I took care of it with my finger. <laughs> okay, so. And it's so rude of them to interrupt the Jimmy Dore. No, I, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. So what are some of those issues you're trying to use the attention you're getting from running? What are you trying to tell me what you're trying to do? Well, I, I want to uh, deal with the issues that the Bernie Sanders is talking about. Uh, I, I dealt with those issues back in 08 and Bernie picked up on that uh, and has been pursuing that ever since. And so all of the domestic issues that Bernie's involved with, I just endure in spades. The other issues, which would be foreign policy issues and uh, and uh, military issues, uh, I probably take a stronger view uh, than uh, Bernie, and I line up very closely with Tulsi Gabbard, who I think is is going to be uh, on the top ticket one way or the other. She has such gravitas when she makes her presentations, mm -hmm. and she's got experience as six years in Armed Services Committee, six years on Foreign Relations Committee, and that shores up uh, the shortcomings that Bernie has in a big way. So I, my dream ticket would be Bernie and Tulsi or vice versa. But I, uh, but, and, and so that's what we're pushing for is these issues, a single payer health care, uh, a, 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 an infrastructural rather than the measly $2 trillion that they're talking about with Trump. That's ridiculous. We, we have a $20 trillion deficit in our infrastructural system. We need to provide education for everybody, uh, from youth to elderly people, and it should be fully paid by the American taxpayer. When, when we deny these funds to education, what we're doing is essentially eating our own seed corn, because our future is going to be these people educated and bringing their genius uh, to the global community. 
We're not, we're not preparing for that. We're not doing that. And China is. And so China's guaranteeing that they'll be ascend, the ascendant power within, the, within 20 years. Now, it seems like there's a pivot, a military pivot. That doesn't seem like they've talked about a military pivot to Asia. Uh, does that mean China? And what does that mean? Do you think that they would actually do hostile military actions to China for, over economic reasons? We do that right now. <laughs> God, what else is new? We do that right now with these silly confrontations in the South China Sea. Mm-hmm. The, you know, we're, we're upset over the fact that China doesn't spend enough money on weapons, which we'd like to see them do, because since we're wasting our treasure on weapons, we want them to waste their treasure on weapons. But what they're doing is they're taking their economic treasure and trying to raise the standard of living of the people throughout the world by, by doing infrastructural improvements. That, that's, that, in my mind, is where the future is. And we've been invited several times to join the Belt, belt and Road, uh, and, and we, we're opposed to that. So what do we do? We want people to, to arm themselves to the teeth, buying our arms and creating uh, jobs in the armaments industry so that they can confront China. They're not going to do that. They're, they're grateful for the fact that China is, is providing the loans and the infrastructure that is going to bring about their development. Now, so when we criticize, like with Sri Lanka, there was a port that was financed by the Chinese, and the operation of it was very poorly done. It was almost led to bankruptcy. So rather than China... What, they didn't go in and do what we did with the IMF in in uh, in Greece and is is squeeze the people at the bottom of the ladder to pay back these loans to banks. No, what we did, what China did in Sri Lanka was they turned around and renegotiated the operation of the port, the operation of the port for the next ninety years, because what they're doing uh, is since the people that were trying to operate it were not doing a good enough job. By taking it over, you're doing a good job. So there's benefit to all of the stakeholders involved in that development. And so they're not holding the people. Uh, the, the loans that China is, isn't this interesting. The loans that China is making around the world to build this infrastructure are not recourse loans. That means that if the loans aren't paid back, you can't go to the public, to the public to the people and squeeze them to pay back the loans. They're non-recourse. And and so if you go to borrow money at the bank, uh, they want your arm and the leg, but the, but no, the Chinese just want the recourse of the loan itself. So what's and, in it What's in it for the Chinese to do this? <laughs> oh, great, great question. First off, China is in a unique history of civilization, was able to move in 30 years, 600 million people from poverty to middle class. Now, that is establishing a lot of freedom. So what is their motivation? Real simple. They've they've done this internally, and yet they realize that they have overcapacity. So to use up that capacity, they go around the world and and start projects where they then help build projects that uses up their excessive capacity, and and it's so it's a win-win for the local government. It's a win-win for China, and it's a win-lose for the United States because we refuse to get involved and and really concentrate on arming ourselves and arming the people uh, to take China on. Not going to happen. China has got too much patience. We're not going to buy into our craziness in this regard. So when you say they that China has overcapacity, you mean they have over, so they have over uh, industrial capacity that they couldn't use in their own country, so that they then export their capacity that way. Is that what you're saying when you say capacity? Both. Yeah, they, that's exactly correct. Uh, oh. And and they they have overcapacity within their country that they're trying to use up as best they can. They did that. That's how they that's how they moved 600 million people from poverty to middle class. Now what they want to do is to move several billion people from poverty to middle class. That's what China is trying to do. And we are opposing them and sabotaging every time they they try this. But but they're going to just be patient uh, and they're not going to confront us. You know, we have the Thucydides trap. I don't know if you're aware of what that is. No. Thucydides was the historian of, of the Peloponnesian War. And what he found was that when the power 
is threatened by an ascendant power, uh, the possibility of war is very eminent. There's been 16 instances of this in human history. Uh, four of them have been resolved peacefully. The rest have all resulted from wars. And so we saw in the last century <clears throat> the loss of, uh, of Britain uh, in, or the attempted uh, conflict between Britain and Germany. And Britain won, but it was a product of a war. Yeah, after the Second World War, the British Empire imploded and they just grabbed us and hung on with us. And so that was a peaceful evolution. Now, what will happen with the United States? If it's up to China, it'll be peaceful. If it's up to the United States, there's a great possibility of war that we would instigate because we resent the fact that China is going to be superior to us economically, scientifically, and many other areas in within 20 years. So they would be the ascendant power, China? Correct. Okay. And we would be the hegemon that is this being displaced by the rise of China. So Trump has been encouraging <laughs> and pushing the European allies to spend more money on arms. And you think that's tied in with the uh, uh, China also? It certainly is, because keep in mind that the United States uh, is responsible for 50% of the arms production in the world. So uh, here, digest that. More than 50% of the arms production in the world is the United States providing that. So what we do is what we want to do is have people buy our arms get, get loaded, loaded up to the teeth with this capability of killing people. Uh, and China takes the opposite direction. Here, let me give you an interesting development that's going on. It's not fully perceived. You, you hear in the American press a great deal about the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, South China Sea and the fact that, that, uh, that China is creating these islands. They're dredging up the dirt in creating an island and putting an airport on the island. What they're doing, and most people don't realize it, these, uh, they only have two aircraft carriers. We have 19. Now, th that'll give you an idea of the disbalance. And so we like to move our aircraft carriers around and show the flag and show how powerful we are. China doesn't have to do that. China's only interested in one thing, and that is sustaining and securing their trade routes. South China Sea is the major trade route for China, also uh, South Korea and Japan. And so they're afraid that the United States with Singapore could block the access out of the South China Sea. So what the Chinese have done, which I think is very clever, they've created these islands and what are they? These islands are stationary aircraft carriers that are unsinkable. <laughs> Let me repeat that. These, these islands are aircraft carriers that are unsinkable, and yet <clears throat> they're in a position, in a defensive position, <clears throat> to defend the position of the South China Sea for the ability of China, Korea, Japan to transmit their treasure to other parts of the world who are prepared to buy it. So aren't nuclear weapons supposed to stop this kind of stuff? Like China has nukes, right? <clears throat> A small fraction of what we have. Yeah, but you only need, I mean, how many nukes do you need? <laughs> well, that's a good question. How many nukes do you need? We have about a thousand pointed at our at Russia and China. How many nukes do we need? Well, let me tell you that right now, the Defense Department and the, our political leadership are spending, they say, $1.7 trillion on refurbishing our nuclear capability. Well, that's not 1.7 trillion. It's more like four or five trillion dollars because if we have cost overruns, as we know, within the Department of Defense. So here we're spending four or five trillion dollars to improve our delivery system and our nuclear capability to be able to threaten the world with terror because we've got the will to use this. Now, this is the top priority of, of the Defense Department. Top priorities to build all these new capabilities. Now, in point of fact, this is the mother of, of boondoggles. Because if you really analyze it, 
these weapons are not usable. If any one of the eight other countries who have nuclear capability were to discharge that nuclear capability, whether it's in uh, whether it's against Iran by Israel, whether it's uh, Pakistan with respect to India, or whether it's the United States uh, w with North Korea, what you do is you trigger a nuclear winter and you eclipse the sun for more than a decade and we're all going to die a miserable death. So these weapons that we're spending trillions of dollars on are not usable I know, by yeah. us or anybody else. And it's thought that we got to have them to retaliate. You don't need to retaliate. Anybody that launches causes a nuclear winter. Yeah, well, so that's that's why. To retaliate. So that's why I'm saying, like, all this stuff of uh, uh, us being, you know, doing the saber rattling with China, it's all moot, isn't it? Because either one of us sets off a nuclear bomb and then that's it. That's what I mean. Like, we have a thousand nukes, they only have a couple. It doesn't matter because if you set off a couple, that's a nuclear winner, right? Well, but uh, you think about maybe 20 to 100 would trigger nuclear winter. But every one of the countries that have nuclear capability have over 200 nukes. So anyone can do this job properly uh, and destroy the planet and destroy all of us that are on. And you say, well, that that's, that's an exaggeration. Oh, no, it's not an exaggeration. I and you would not be here if it weren't for a fellow by the name of Vasily Akipov who was the one that, that prevailed in a contest within a, within a sub that had a nuclear device uh, and was prepared to, and really gave the order to launch it, and Akipov used his position to deny that launch. That means that the, that the issue between Kennedy and Khrushchev was moved. The decision was made by a nuclear command, a submarine commander to go ahead and unleash Armageddon. And and I was 32 at the time, uh, and uh, and we would not I would not be here if it weren't for Vasily Arkhipov, a Russian uh, uh, commandant uh, commander who later became a, um, uh, a an admiral and who also died of radiation because he was the executive officer on the, the K-19, the Widowmaker. So there's a whole history of this going on with the nukes. But what disturbs me is that you get normal people uh, on the Armed Services Committee and normal people in the Pentagon that are that are fashioning these suicide pills for all of us, and they and they just act like this is just normal. There's nothing there's nothing unusual about setting the world and destroying the world. Uh, you know that that's our job. We're built. We're we're the military leaders. That's our job is to quote. Defend the country, but it's the defend of country like we were going to do in Vietnam. If we used nukes, we could destroy the country in order to defend it. And that's what we're talking about. We're going to destroy the world in order to make it safe for democracy. Right now, they're getting ready to destroy Iran again. And do, do you? it feels to me like, like people will see through this one. Or enough people will see through this because they. It seems like enough people saw through Venezuela and Syria uh, to stop it, right? So we didn't go to war in Syria. We, I mean, we did clandestine war, but not a, you know, a stated war. And but that's war. But that, Jimmy, that's war. And when we do these, uh, the the sanctions, that's war. Yeah. Make no mistake about it. We're killing about forty thousand plus kids in Venezuela right today as we talk. And, and to kill that many people and say that that's not war is, is really burying your head in the sands. And we do the same thing. Uh, you, you recall what happened under Bill Clinton. We killed 500,000 kids and Madeleine Albright said, said it was well, worth that, it. that's, that's uh, what they call collateral damage. This is not collateral damage. We, so we go around the world and sanction people at will if they don't really hone to our leadership. Now, of course, the tyrants, they just suck up to us and we protect them uh, and we don't talk about any sanctions. The, the use of sanctions is the abuse of our having the, the, the dollar is the, is the tool of, uh, of global uh, monetary system. Now, what's happening is it's going to change. These people are going to gang up on us and before I know it, the dollar will not be the medium of global uh, transfer. It will be 
the Chinese and the Euro and others. So our, our stupidity is opening the world, uh, is accelerating the rate under which China will be the hegemon in the world. And based upon their historic record and their record right now, they will do a better job in providing for world peace than we have in the last hundred years. And the reason why we're such a warmongering nation, even though we, we're brainwashing and thinking we're the bringers of democracy and liberty, the reason why is because the military industrial complex has captured our government, right? That's the reason? Totally. Yeah. Lock, stock, and barrel. And it didn't just happen now. This, this goes back to the framers of the Constitution establishing slavery for perpetuity. And in the Constitution, they made sure that you could not do away with slavery. Uh, it, and it took a civil war to do it. And yet, even after the Civil War, you had the machinizations of the uh, 1877 election with Tilden uh, and uh, the other guy. Uh, and, of course, what they did is they stopped the Reconstruction Program in the South, which should have gone on for another 25 years to make it stick. But what we've done with, uh, and Jill Lepore has a great uh, history out called These Truths, and, and what we have is a situation where uh, the, the, the underlying thread of our development was slavery, and in addition to the coarsening of our human psyche and destroying the American psyche in that regard, it was added by the coarsening of what we did to indigenous people, which was genocide. We didn't try to enslave the Indians. We had a policy of annihilation. And that's what we live with today, is, is though we don't recognize it and, uh, and the pundits are saying how great we are, that's the reason why the people have been so dumbed down on this subject, is because they've been in, intoxicated with the fact that we are the greatest nation in the world. That is nothing but bullshit. The, there's, we're not the greatest nations. We don't even come close to it. And yet, uh, that's what we've uh, caused the American people to believe. And so in our hubris, in our hubris, it sets us up to go ahead and support what is in opposed to our self-interest. And that's what's going on in this country today. And we will be able to break the Gordian knot that's tied us up in that. The only way I know of is to empower the people to make laws in a very deliberative fashion. So, what, do you, I mean, it's happening right now, Iran. So they're trying to manufacture consent for us to go to war with Iran, the country right next to Iraq. You would think that, I mean, it's going to be a heavier lift this time. Do you have a prediction what will happen? Oh, there's, uh, there's no question. Uh, uh, Iran has great capability to defend itself. That doesn't mean that they won't get annihilated. But I'll tell you, we'll pay such a price uh, that it'll be under. Uh, here, they've got cruise missiles that uh, have been developed that they can take out an aircraft carrier. So here you have an aircraft carrier fleet. That's about the aircraft carrier with about 20, 30 vessels around it for screen protection. protection. But now with the new technology we have, uh, you could just void all of that and, then, and just knock off these aircraft carriers one at a time. They're surface vessels. What's not viable uh, to being knocked off is our, our, is our submarine, our Trident submarines. And you want to know how secure we are in that? We could do away with our nukes in the silos. We could do away with our cruise missiles and just leave us alone. And we should, we should do away with these voluntarily without any negotiation of any country and do it openly and invite all the new countries to watch us destroy those weapons. And what we would still have 12 Trident submarines, each one with 280 warheads Jeez. able to target. Now, 12 by 280, you can do the math. We, we could hold the world hostage with one Trident submarine. And that's what we have. We have a redundancy, a foolish redundancy, which was to accommodate admirals and generals. Most people don't realize that we have more admirals and generals right now uh, on the payroll than we had when we had 12 million people under arms in the Second World War. Huh. Does that not say something? And of course, the military have a grid system to cover the entire world. So we have divided up the world into a grid system where we have an admiral or a general who covers uh, these areas because, of course, we're the world herjabon and, uh, and we have to 
we're responsible for controlling everybody. Well, um, I I'm, I really hope you can make it mm-hmm. into the debates. I hope you start polling a little higher. So the the the, the litmus test, I think, is you have to get it. Uh, was it one percent in the poll? And, yeah, one percent in the polls, and in several polls, I'm more than that. Yeah, in several polls, I I beat uh, Beto, I beat Hillbrand, I beat uh, you know Warren. So it depends on the poll, and obviously where the poll is of a uh, progressive community, I do very well. But but that's no different than what happened in '08. They pushed me out of the debates, and yet whenever they did blind polls, I was always on top. Yeah, I remember those debates, and I remember, I didn't know who you were, but I remember like, wow, he's really saying a lot of hard truths nobody else will, and they openly mocked you. Oh, yeah. Well, what else is doing? <laughs> the, the, the truth sometimes cannot be handled by, by uh, uh, mental midgets. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that's who we have in power in this country. Yes, no, no doubt about it. I mean, and not and not just in the White House. Uh, well, no, of course, in the Congress. Do you think all this nuclear stuff happens by accident? Of course not. This is the Congress that sucks up to this and, and empowers that. That's the reason why I'm so supportive of uh, AOC uh, Cortez, that uh, what she's talking about is to try and bring a new element within the, uh, within the Democratic Party in the Congress that is responsible for these things. You don't vote for these budgets. You just don't vote. Uh, no. Of course, the, 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 the lobbyists of the military industrial complex, they go into your congressional district and try to get you defeated. Or, so this is what the, uh, what's been done. And Ocasio is trying to turn this on themselves. And that is to don't donate to the D- Democratic uh, Congressional Committee. Donate to the individuals that you believe in. Because what will what the Democratic committee will do is to parcel out the money they collect, like they do in the Senate, to all of the incumbents, whether you're a good incumbent or a bad incumbent. And what uh, AOC wants to do is to distinguish between who's a good incumbent and who's a bad incumbent, and rightly so. So do you, it's a snail's pace, the progressive takeover of the Democratic Party, if it's happening at all. Uh, people don't realize that the Democratic leadership is actually to the right of Trump voters. So Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are are not lefties in any sense of the word. They're corporatists through and through, and their political positions are literally to the right of Trump voters. So they are uh, Trump voters are for taxing the wealthy. She is not. Trump voters are for ending the wars. She is not. Trump voters are for single payer health care. The Democratic leadership is not. Uh, so what do you make of the progressive takeover of the democratic party? And, uh, we'll just, I'll just ask you that. Well, it was successful in the last election. Will it be in the next election? I don't know. That's the reason I and other people are working very hard to get the message across to the general public. But like I say, the general public has been dumbed down by the military industrial complex and the false hubris. I think the most damaging thing of all in our society is the false hubris, where we think we're better than anybody else in the world. And so when Americans are unemployed and they still think that, oh, we're the best, well, hell, we're not the best. You're unemployed, Charlie, and you ought to wake up to that fact. Yeah. Uh, you, the people, they keep talking about what's radicalizing people in America. And uh, though if, if it's YouTube or if it's Trump's rhetoric or if it's immigration, what radicalizes people in America is that they have an economic system that threw them overboard 40 years ago. Uh, they have uh, when 80 percent of workers live paycheck to paycheck, when 60 percent of Americans can't afford a four hundred dollar emergency and 30 million Americans don't have health care at all. And the rest of them who do worry about going bankrupt every time they get sick. That is what radicalizes people and pushes people to demagogues and con men like Donald Trump. So if you're afraid of that stuff, maybe the left would start offering people something to actually help their lives in the richest country in the face of the earth has ever seen. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that regard. And that's the problem we have. And, uh, you know, we used to laugh, the Democrats used to laugh about the fact that the people in Kansas would always be voting for people that are, that do not, that are not in their self-interest. 
Well, we do that nationally. Yes. And it's only recently that I've really focused on the fact that that it's really our our hubris, our our arrogance that we think when you begin to think that you're better than somebody else generically, and then you're really on the downhold sl- slope. And that's where we are both militarily uh, and politically in the world today. We think we're better than anybody else. Well, the Chinese are going to embarrass us because they're going to show us that we're not better than they are. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, Senator Gravel, I really appreciate you taking time. Is there anything we didn't get to you want to talk about? No, just to repeat the fact that the that the answer is for the people to vote, to create a legislature of the people and provide for its operations in a very deliberative fashion. That's the answer. It's the people. It's not the government. Thank you, Jimmy, for having me on your show. Okay, Senator Mike Gravel, I really appreciate your voice. Thanks for telling the truth, and thanks for sticking your chin out, as always. Uh, You're (laughs) always welcome back. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, we just added St. Louis and Honolulu to our live tour schedule. Go to jimmydoorcomedy.com for a link for all the tickets for all our live shows. We might be coming to your town. Go check right now at jimmydoorcomedy.com. And if you like the show and want to support it, become a premium member. You can become a patron or through PayPal or go right to jimmydoorcomedy.com and become a premium member. That's the best way. We'll see you at a live show.